Good morning and welcome to the Hub City Church. We're so glad you decided to join us in worship this morning. If you're new to our church, we exist to make disciples who believe the gospel, abide in Christ, and obey the word of God. If you'd like more information about our vision, if you'd like to get connected to biblical community through groups, or if you'd like to find an opportunity to serve the body of Christ with us, you can visit our website, thehubcitychurch.org, or just text the word Hub City to 97000 and we'll follow up with you in the next few days. As we get ready to enter into corporate worship, if you're worried about having little ones in service with you, we want you to be at ease. We love kids and have a lot of them here. There are coloring sheets in the back of the sanctuary, our kids ministry is always available to you, and we have a nursing mother's room with our service streaming live just outside the lobby to the left. Again, we're so glad you're here. Let's worship Jesus together. All right. Well, hey, good morning, guys. Glad to be here worshiping Jesus with you as always. My name is Tad Anderson. Uh, I am one of the pastors here, the lead teaching pastor. And on behalf uh, of the Hub City Church, we're so glad you're here today. Just uh, one announcement for you. Um, it's kind of a multi-announcement and one announcement. But our summer schedule um, is up officially. Yep. So, um, hey, just so you know, the way we've kind of structured that is that we will have at least one um, fellowship or outreach uh, event scheduled per month over the summer. Uh, the way it works is uh, our, our men's and women's groups will continue to run through the summer, but traditionally our community groups kind of take a little uh, breather in the summer uh, since it's a time where a lot of people are going on family vacations and things like that, and so it's a little more sporadic with people's group attendance. And so we just want to uh, have something going on every month together, kind of as a, as a touch point, so we're all staying connected and staying updated on how each other are, are doing. And so, um, yeah, also it's a way to stay on mission together. So uh, just a few things you'll see on that schedule. The first one is a May play day. We just kind of, that's just a way to come together out in the backyard, probably have a big water slide, the biggest one they have, if we can find that, because um, that's always fun, and do some games and, and grilling out there, just some fellowship. We'll also try and do a, uh, an outdoor movie night uh, we tried last year, but it rained, so I'm really hoping it's not going to rain this time. Uh, then also we have our 4th of July outreach in Twin Hills Park. That's always a really great time. Uh, somewhat like our Easter outreach, we partner with the city of Crestview, uh, and we just kind of go out there and love on our community, pass out free water, free glow sticks, popsicles to kids, and just get into conversations so with people, get to know people here in our city, uh, share the gospel if we can. Uh, so, And then also we have a, uh, another thing this year, it's, it's somewhat new. I mean, we've been doing this backpack program for a long time, but actually for the first time, Northwood Elementary School reached out to us uh, and said, hey, will you guys come uh, in the beginning of the school year and help us get people signed up? For the backpack program. And so uh, we'll do that as well. We'll go over there and, and help get um, families, children signed up for this program where we can kind of help feed them through the year. Um, and then we'll uh, kind of as our last hurrah, we'll do uh, beach baptisms on September 3rd. That's Labor Day weekend. Okay. Uh, there may be more stuff going on than that, but that's what we've got so far. Uh, okay. There'll also be, I'm sure, um, less official, uh, unpublished things going on in your groups and things like that as well. All right. But um, as always, as these events get closer, Closer. We'll have more specific details for you. We'll push that out through social media, the app, website, and all of that. But we hope you'll join us for the summer. Okay, well, uh, this is our, um, our second to last week in the book of Proverbs. 11 weeks we've been here. And uh, man, I really enjoyed it. I hope that you have too. But really, I hope that um, it's been formative for your spiritual growth and desire to walk in wisdom as a follower of of Christ. And if nothing else, I hope that you will take me up on the suggestion to read a proverb a day. Okay? Uh, it keeps the folly away, as my wife says. But anyway, uh, these, these final uh, three weeks, as I mentioned last Sunday, are focused on different aspects of human relationships. Last week, we talked 
about uh, generally about the importance of our words, the amazing reality uh, of being made as image bearers of God and uh, you know word speaking creatures. We said that we we speak because God speaks, but then also you know what our words say about our hearts and then how our words can affect other people, either for good or for bad. Uh, This week, we'll be getting into another broad topic that all of us should desire to be wise about, and that is the topic of conflict. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so let's, uh, let's pray, and we'll dive into it. Father, God, you, you are the perfect and most glorious Father. Thank you for this day that we have to, to gather together as the body of Christ to make much of Jesus and the gospel by which we now have the right to approach you as our Father. And Lord, now as we get into another prevalent topic from the book of Proverbs, my prayer is that you would help us all to be honest with ourselves. God, no sermon that I preach, regardless of how real or understanding of the human condition or applicable or or relevant or whatever, none of that means anything if your Holy Spirit does not open hearts and minds to see you as who you are and to see ourselves as who we truly are. So God, would you do that this morning? Especially in a discussion on conflict, we need your help so that we won't attempt to inwardly explain away all of the conflicts in our lives as someone else's fault other than our own or excuse ourselves from culpability when when we could stand to handle ourselves better in the midst of relational tension with others. No one in this room, myself included, none of us, God, are grace graduates. We all continue to need your abundant mercy. And these things are not natural. Fighting is natural. Being defensive is natural. Running away from people we disagree with is natural. But for those of us who claim to have been born again, we are no longer just natural. We have had a supernatural miracle happen in our hearts called regeneration. We're now new creations in Christ, you tell us, God. And so would you help us today as we consider these things from your word, Lord. Help us to begin living more like who you've made us to be. Help us to be more humble, reasonable, peaceable people who navigate conflict in a way that's countercultural. It's for your glory, and it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Well, in the biblical worldview, if you're looking at history, okay, from a macro perspective or a top level kind of you know, 30,000 foot view, we believe as Christians that God is in sovereign control over the flow of all things. Common words for that are that God ordains or he orchestrates um, uh, the, the providential flow of history for his divine purpose. We'll talk more about that as we get into Ephesians in a few weeks. But on the ground or at the kind of micro level from our finite human perspective, um, history is moving along day by day by the actions and the decisions of humanity. And to get to the point, I would make the assertion that human conflict is actually one of the key drivers of events in history. We see this in the storyline of the Bible. Uh, A spiritual conflict between Satan, who sets himself up as God's enemy, uh, that introduces sin into the world. A conflict between Isaac and Jacob that gives way to the nation of Israel. A conflict between Joseph and his brothers that leads to uh, the preservation of Israel in Egypt. A conflict between Moses and Pharaoh that leads to the Exodus, the Israelites, the Canaanites, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, Jews, and Jesus, right? And, And on and on we could go. Conflict drives the narrative of Scripture from the human perspective. But the reality is, 
This same thing is true even today. Conflicts between individuals, families, political parties, nations, and so forth, they influence the progression of human events. Uh, as a, for instance, the conflict between you know, Martin Luther and, and the Catholic Church over the nature of the Christian faith and salvation by grace alone in, in the 1500s, that conflict, it began the shaping of the clear doctrinal beliefs that we hold today. Uh, really, our, our, our general title as Protestants uh, literally, it harkens back to uh, that conflict or that protest right, against the sinful and unbiblical works-based practices associated with the Roman Catholic Church at the time of the Reformation. But anyway, all that to say, in a world like ours that is broken by sin, conflict is a reality for all of us. Okay? Um, you, you have witnessed and you have been a part of conflicts interpersonally or as a collective group in different ways in your life thus far. And you likely will be involved in more conflict as time goes on. That's just how it goes. Hurt happens. Disagreement happens. Misunderstanding happens. And when it does, conflict ensues, right? Anglican Bishop Michael Lawson has said, there is no immunity from conflict. It gets us all in the end. Its targets are wide, its pains prolonged. Arguments, aggression, even complete relational breakdown can happen to anyone, regardless of the, of the deftness we normally bring to our relationships. When conflict surfaces, its power to overwhelm us can be deeply perplexing. So while, while conflict on one hand, it, it serves uh, kind of the progression of life in a sense, and it generates um, tension or pressure that can, in a roundabout way, lead to positive outcomes like the forming of new organizations or the nominating of better leaders or the correcting of unhelpful practices, conflict must be dealt with, right? <laughs> It has to be dealt with. It has to be navigated. You could try to run from it, but if that's your method of handling conflict, you might end up living as a hermit in the mountains somewhere because where there are people, there's conflict. Okay, um, I've been in multiple churches in my time as a Christian, some that did not faithfully preach the gospel, uh, others that did, but there was conflict in both kinds. Okay, uh, growing up, I spent time with both sides of my family, my mom's side of the family, my dad's side of the family. Both sides had the occasional conflict. Okay, uh, I've been a, a part of all sorts of teams and groups and clubs and committees and various work environments and spheres of life. And any that I spent enough time in, eventually I witnessed conflict. For crying out loud, my, my kids play city sports and there's a conflict every year between parents and coaches of like five and six year old T ball, right? Um, my point is finding oneself in the midst of conflict is inevitable. And so we have to learn to deal with it, we have to learn to navigate it. And if we will look to scripture, what we'll see is that God has not left us to figure it out on our own. But because of the prevalence of conflict, the Lord in his wisdom supplies us with a lot of insight for how to do so in the ways that are best. All right? That said, uh, here's the first thing I want to get out on the table. It maybe seems obvious, but it shouldn't go without saying the Bible generally, but Proverbs more specifically, the Bible places a high value on something countercultural, maintaining relational peace with others. Okay, maintaining relational peace with others. I think we're living in one of the most angry, disunified, strife-ridden times in history. And I, I won't get off on a tangent here because I've said this before. I just think so much of it has to do with the inception and now widespread use of social media. Anyone can get behind a keyboard and say anything they want to anyone else without fear of repercussion because they're not face-to-face. They can just be as mean-spirited and harsh as their heart really feels because usually there's no real-time uh, consequences in person. But anyway, my, my point is, while conflict is common to all people, for Christians, we are to strive for peace as the end 
of all our conflicts. Okay? This is countercultural. There, there's sometimes, on the other hand, there, there's sometimes a, a common misconception that, that being a Christian means that you should never experience conflict. Okay? But that's, that's just not true. If you read the New Testament, what you'll see is that there are conflicts that take place even between the apostles after they're filled with the Spirit and leading the church. Okay, so it's, it's not that we should be aiming to experience no conflict, as that's not a realistic expectation, okay? But we should be people who are characterized as peacemakers, as Jesus says of his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to some of the things Proverbs says about the value of striving for peace with others. Proverbs 15 says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Proverbs 16, Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Proverbs 17 says, Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Proverbs 21, it's better to live uh, in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. It's better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. Sorry, ladies, it goes the other way too, okay? <laughs> There's actually more references where it says things like that, you know, a quarrelsome wife's like the dripping of rain. But I didn't want to like pour it on too, too heavy, you know, but, but, but um, the same is true about a quarrelsome husband, okay? The same is true. So uh, do you see why I say that, that Proverbs places a high value on peace? It says repeatedly that it's better to be poor, alone, and hungry, but at peace, than to have it all and live a life that's full of quarreling and strife. And this theme It doesn't end in Proverbs. It continues on into the New Testament. And actually, it gains a lot more clarity in the the New Testament. We find out from the teachings uh, of the New Testament that the the peace with God that we have received by the reconciling work of Christ on the cross okay, for our sin, his settling of our greatest conflict with his blood, that secured vertical peace with God and it should flow out into horizontal peace in our relationships with others, okay? Uh, well, we're going to talk more about this. Josh actually read from Ephesians. We'll talk about that more later. But um, listen to this laser-clear call to strive for peace in Romans chapter 12. There's more here, but here's verses 17 and 18. It says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible... So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So, considering these these two pretty undeniable truths, right? That on one hand, conflict is going to be an ongoing reality for us as part of the, the human experience, okay? But on the other hand, that as Christians, we're called to strive to maintain a peaceable life. How do we do that? How do we do that. This is not a sermon specifically on the process for walking through conflict, though I will touch on that some. Uh, We we also discussed that several weeks ago in our sermon on anger, so I don't want to be uh, redundant. Today I want to talk about principles that will help us to wisely manage the tension between the inevitability of conflict and our call to be peacemakers. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Proverbs has a lot to say in this regard, as do the scriptures in general. So let's take a look at it together. I've really tried to boil this down. And so I boiled it down into to four key principles for resolving conflict wisely and peaceably. I'm certain we could come up with more than this, but hopefully this is a good place to start. The, the first two principles that we're going to talk about are going to be proactive steps you should take, uh, things you should do before conflict ever happens. Okay, And then the second two are principles you should, you should consider in the midst of a conflict that's actually happening. All right, So uh, let's go. Number one, proactive principle for resolving conflict peaceably. Number one, ask the Lord to make you an expert on your own weaknesses 
and shortcomings. Because this breeds a posture of humility in dealing with others. Listen to what Scripture has to say uh, on, on this, on asking the Lord to make you an expert on your own weaknesses. Uh, Proverbs, Proverbs 12 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. <clears throat> Proverbs 16, All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Proverbs 18, The one who states his case first seems right until, until the other comes and examines him. Proverbs 21, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. Proverbs 30, there are those who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth, right? James 1, 19 here, listen to this. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak, right? So, and this one's not in your notes, but we've read it already in this series. Uh, Psalm 139 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, considering what we know about conflict, here is why it's so important for you to, and me to be consistently in God's word and in prayer every day. And In our time spent with the Lord, to be asking him to reveal more of who you are to you, right? That is, for for him to to make you more self-aware, to make you less confident in your own strengths and abilities, and more cognizant of your own frailty, and more dependent on his strength and his grace, and the enlightening power of his word in your life. Here's why. As you do this... The Lord is going to humble you. The Lord is going to humble you. If you will go consistently to God's word, asking him to sanctify you, to grow you, to show you where you might need to repent and change, to be more like his son, in my experience, that's a prayer that God's going to answer. That's a prayer that God's going to answer. And actually, more than that, this is something that should become a really normative experience for a follower of Jesus. Opening the Bible and being convicted and gently corrected and redirected by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I don't know about you, but I don't wake up every morning just naturally excited to do God's will. Some mornings, sure, Increasingly, a lot of mornings, but definitely not every morning. I may be a Holy Spirit-filled man of God. I believe that's true, but here's the thing. I'm still living in this flesh. Anybody else? Romans 7, okay? And so it is a precious promise from me, Lamentations 3, that God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Because every morning, I need my will to die. And I need my flesh to come under submission to the gracious will of God again. Wears off while I'm sleeping, right? Flesh grows stronger during that time, right? So I need to come back under submission to the will of God. You see, Tad Anderson, believe it or not, is not a natural sweetheart, all right? He can be, just ask Amy, he can be grumpy, Prone to be pessimistic, selfish, uncharitable. You know how I know that? Because I'm married on one hand, but also (laughs) in conjunction with that, because in time, in the study of and meditation on God's word, God in his kindness has begun to make me an expert on my weaknesses. On my shortcomings, on my failures as a man, as a disciple, as a husband, as a dad, and so forth. I'm just being honest. It's, it's not always felt good to see myself in the mirror. Dads, a lot of you know what I mean. When you got married, you're probably in decent shape. That's in part how you lock down that bride of yours, right? But in time, 
If you had a few kids, your pantry started to fill up with goldfish and Uncrustables instead of creatine and zero sugar whey protein, right? Yes, I know what those things are. And at some point, you walked by your wife's full-length mirror and went, ooh, who is that? Right? Only to realize in horror, that guy is you, <laughs> right? He's got a keg instead of a six-pack, right? And his arms, if they could even still be referred to as guns, they, they're not AR-15s anymore, you know? They're a couple subcompact Ruger LCPs, pew, pew, you know, like... <laughs> but, I've digressed, okay? Yeah, (laughs) okay. Uh, This is what what God's word does for us in a spiritual sense. As we go to it day by day, it opens our eyes to see ourselves more clearly, and it will humble us to be honest about who we really are shortcomings, weaknesses, and all, okay? And it's possible to train ourselves for godliness and to grow in those areas for sure, but we never graduate this side of eternity from having weaknesses and shortcomings, okay? The best we can do is really grow more aware of them and be on guard against them, okay? Now, people who have come to learn this Right? People who no longer consider themselves wise in their own eyes. People who don't think that all of their ways are always just inherently pure and perfect. People who allow the Lord to shape them and guide them and examine them regularly. Okay? These are people who tend to handle conflict better and who have the wisdom from the Lord to come to peaceable resolutions because they're not under as much illusion about who they are, right? The Lord has shown them that they continue to need to grow and change to be more like Christ. So when someone comes to a person like this with a grievance, it's not super surprising to them. All right? it's, not, um, it's not like this mind-blowing discovery to them that maybe something they did or said offended or, or hurt someone else. Okay? Like, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but if you've ever been upset with someone and you've gone to them about it and they responded like this, they, they listened to what you said and in humility they went low. They acknowledge the problem, and they ask for your forgiveness. That is like throwing a bucket of ice into a pot of boiling water, isn't it? Here's what I mean. Humility brings the temperature of conflict way down, way down. Proverbs 15.1 says this, A harsh word stirs up anger, but a soft answer turns away wrath, okay? Pastor Jason shared this great quote uh, from Tim uh, Tim Keller with me this week, and I think it's super helpful to this discussion. Here's what he says. He says, if someone is criticizing you and the criticism is mostly mistaken, right? They're mostly wrong, okay? Identify the 10% of the indictment that's fair. And without excuse... Be willing to take it to heart because the strongest Christians are the ones who are most willing to repent. Okay. Do you know who the Christians are who are most humbly willing to repent in the midst of conflict? The ones who are already being led to repent all the time before the Lord as they come prayerfully to his word. Okay, So if you are taking time daily to sit quietly before the Lord and hear from him, then when someone else comes along to you with a problem, it will be more natural for James 1.19 to happen, for you to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Friends, a, a huge issue 
that tends to blow conflict way out of proportion in comparison to the actual issue at hand is the reality that we don't listen. What? <laughs> we, don't, we don't listen. As challenging as this is, guys, God has given us brothers and sisters in Christ to sometimes be the faithful messengers who see something sinful and out of line with the will of God in our heart and life and to come and speak the truth to us in love. And I don't think this comes naturally to anyone to enjoy those kinds of situations where you have to sit and listen to someone's criticism of you. The flesh just doesn't like that, right? But it is possible to come to an understanding before it ever happens through your walk with the Lord that he is going to bring things to your attention. God loves you. And so he's going to bring things to your attention on a regular basis that need to change, where you need to grow to think and to be different. And if you will humble yourself in that way, then conflict and confrontation can actually become an opportunity for growth, both personally and maybe in trust with the person who was bold enough to come to confront you, all right? So, um, so in summary, okay, people who are regularly listening to the Lord's correction of them and repenting privately are the people who are more able to quickly de-escalate conflict with humility, all right? Because they've, they've grown to be experts on their own weaknesses and shortcomings. On the other hand, typically, the people who are the most defensive and harsh, and unwilling to admit any wrong on their part, usually those are the people who are not regularly abiding in Christ through time in the Word. Okay, And this really leads right into the second principle we should consider regarding the wise handling of conflict. We need to understand that all conflict is fueled by sin. Oftentimes, your own. This is a problem between you and God before it's ever a problem with someone else. Okay, Listen to what Proverbs says, Proverbs 14. Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner. Whoever loves transgression loves strife. He who makes his door high seeks destruction. Drive out a scoffer and strife will go out and quarreling and abuse will cease. For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there's no whisperer, quarreling ceases. As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. Okay, So all these proverbs are hitting on the fact that at the end of the day, relational strife, quarreling, and conflict arise due to people sinning against one another. Okay? When we, when we love our sin more than we love people, it's going to lead to strife. It's going to lead to strife. When you have a low view of other people, you don't respect other people, you don't honor other people, right? as opposed to considering other people more important than yourself as we're commanded, that's sin. And it's going to lead to you upsetting people with your pride. Okay? Or... If you're just a really particular person who thinks you're right about every little thing, and so you're always challenging other people, even on stuff that doesn't really matter, that's called being quarrelsome. It's not Christ-like, and it breeds conflict, okay? Now, the truth is, if you don't see yourself somewhere in there, then you need to wake up to reality, Okay, James chapter 4 says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. He's speaking generally here. 
to everyone, right? This is what causes conflict. If we were all perfect and sinless, there would be no more conflict, because we would all always want the same exact thing all the time, right? We would, we'd want whatever glorified God most all the time. If we were all perfect, then we would only be exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit all the time. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? Anybody knocking it out of the park every day on that? Right, okay. Um, that's what I thought. Me either, okay? So, um, because as it stands, we are still sinners, who continue to wrestle every day with choosing to obey God instead of choosing sin. And the reality is, when conflict arises in our lives, it is in part either because we've sinned against someone, or they've sinned against us, or get this one, both. Both. I want you to think, I want you to think for just a second, about the last conflict that you were in. Sorry to do that to you, but I want you to think about the last conflict you were in with your spouse or a parent, friend, whoever. Was there sin involved? Was there sin involved? Yeah, there was, right? Here's the harder question. Was there any sin on your part? Was there any sin on your part? Even a little bit. Like Keller said, uh, even was even 10% of the conflict due to some sin on your part, no matter how small it might have been. Was there sin on your part? Probably. I'll tell you how it goes in the Anderson house a lot, okay? (laughs) Most conflicts in my house start with one person's sin. Okay, they start with one person's sin. Somebody being inconsiderate about something, usually, right? Just use your imagination. It's probably happened, okay? But, but what happens next is while it started as the sin of one person, the sin of that person became the occasion for the sin of the other person to come erupting out, Right? One person's sin purges another person's sin, okay? And in the end, while it was only one person who started it, in the end, there was sin on both sides of the conflict. I don't know, maybe maybe my house is just a crazy house. Maybe you don't know what that's like. But um, but if you've experienced um, something like that in your own house, here's why I say this is This is why we need to be proactive on this principle, okay? of understanding that all conflict is fueled by sin. Oftentimes, your own sin. We got to get that settled in here, guys. We got to get that settled in here. Right? And don't forget the second part of that point. Sin is a problem first between you and God before it's a problem with anyone else. Okay? Uh, You might have gotten into a fight with your spouse But the reality is, it's because you weren't thinking about your spouse as the gift of God in your life that they are. You were thinking of them as an annoyance or whatever, right? Or or you might be at odds with a sibling or, or a friend, and before it was ever about them, it was about you not loving them as yourself, right? This is why when King David sins against Uriah and Bathsheba and Joab and his famous adultery murder debacle in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Afterwards, when he repents, his prayer to God in Psalm 51 is this, against you and you alone, God, have I sinned. (laughs) Now, David sinned against a bunch of people when he did what he did with Bathsheba. But what he's saying is that his sin was first and primarily against God. Because in order to do what he did, he had to disregard and dishonor God first. The same is true for us. When we stir up conflict or become a contributor to conflict, it begins with the sin of disregarding how God would have us to act. How God would have us to treat others. 
Okay? And this is why, okay, this is why Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 5, if you've done something wrong to someone, don't be coming up in worship with your hands raised, acting like everything's okay. That's my paraphrase, sorry. Uh, Matthew 5 says, um, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come back and offer your gift. Why does he say this? Why is this order so important to Jesus? Reconcile conflict with your brother before you give a gift to God. Because if you are in an unresolved conflict, and it is in part because of your own sin, then before you come trying to worship through singing or offering, you need to worship through repentance. You need to worship through repentance. There's a theme in Scripture of coming to God with clean hands. God does not appreciate people coming and playing church, acting like they love him so much when they have irreconciled wrongs with people that need to be made right. Okay, Because when we wrong others, and we stir up conflict with our own sin against others, that's just not a little relational problem over here, okay? That's a God problem. That's a God problem. I'm not going to tell you to get up out of your seat right now and leave if you need to go reconcile with somebody, but um, if you're in the service right now, and a conflict is coming to mind that you've had a part in, you should make it a matter of first importance to reconcile that conflict after this service. You should do that. Why? Because Jesus says so. Okay? Jesus says so. Okay, so proactive principles for resolving conflict with wisdom. Number one, ask the Lord to make you an expert on your own weaknesses and shortcomings because this breeds a posture of humility in dealing with others. Number two, Understand all conflict is fueled by sin, oftentimes your own, and this is a problem between you and God before anyone else. If you get those things right, the second two principles um, that you should practice in conflict, they, they should flow pretty easily. Okay, here's number three. Always give grace and benefit of the doubt because relationships with fellow sinners are just messy. They're just messy. Okay? I don't think based on all we've covered today already that I need to spend a super long time here, but let me read these Proverbs to you. Proverbs 17, 9 says, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Proverbs 24, 29 says, Do not say, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back for what he has done. Right? The truth is, if you are someone <clears throat> who is acquainted with your own shortcomings and who has uh, seen how your own sin contributes to conflict, if you've seen those things, then when someone else wrongs you, the first thing out of you should not be anger and frustration. Okay, The first thing out of you should not be anger and frustration. It should be grace. <laughs> it should be grace. As followers of Christ, we should not be walking around locked and loaded, ready for a fight. Okay? Fellow Christian, in a culture of outrage and cancellation, we should be people who are really hard to offend. <laughs> we should be people who are really hard to offend. We should be people who are quick to forgive, quick to extend benefit of the doubt and move on. Because we know two or more sinners determining to spend prolonged amounts of time with one another is a recipe for tension. So you're going you're gonna to rub off on each other, right? right? Like you're going you're gonna to rub each other the wrong way. You're going to say something stupid or unkind, 
right? You're going to forget each other's birthdays or anniversaries. We're, we're going to blow it every now and then. Am I the only one still blowing it sometimes? Okay, I guess I am. All right. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. I don't know. But I, I think Scripture says we're going to blow it sometimes. This is part of doing life on life. You would think that maybe, if you're being logical, you would think maybe it's the people who know you best who would be least likely to hurt you or who would hurt you the least. But honestly, I found it to be the other way around, man. I found it to be the other way around. The closer you get with somebody the greater the likelihood for conflict. It's because relationships between sinners are messy. They're messy. So don't jump to thinking the worst about someone the minute they step out of line with you. Proverbs 19.11 says, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. I'm not suggesting that you should never bring a grievance up with someone. Okay, that would be contrary to what I've taught in other places. But sometimes, I want you to follow me here. Sometimes, depending on the severity of a situation, you can just let things go. (laughs) You can just let things go. Ask yourself, is this really worth me getting upset over? If not, man, it should be like water off a duck's back, right? Colossians 3 says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive Think about how often you sin against the Lord and he forgives you. He forgives you. Think of how many times you have sinned and you don't even know it. You don't even know it. And instead of bringing your life to a screeching halt until you have repented, God just, he just graciously passed over it. Not because of you. Not because you deserve to get off the hook. But because of Jesus. He just extended mercy to you instead of judgment like you deserved, right? Church, we can do that same thing with others. We can do that same thing with others. Proverbs 19 says, It is the glory of a wise person to overlook an offense. If we are experts on our own weaknesses, and we understand that we are sinners, then when a fellow sinner sins against us in some way that's not the end of the world, we can just let it go. Let it go. We should always be giving grace. And benefit of the doubt, because relationships between fellow sinners are just messy. But finally, here's the last principle that we'll discuss this morning. If you find yourself in a conflict that is particularly challenging, where for whatever reason you're, you're, you're trying to make it right and it's, it's just not working, like you and this other person, you just can't seem to see eye to eye. You can't, you're trying to reconcile and it's not working, okay? Don't hesitate to get help if and when necessary from trustworthy counselors. Okay? Don't hesitate to get help if and when necessary from trustworthy counselors. Listen to these scriptures. Proverbs 13 says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Matthew 18, you probably know this one. This is Jesus who says this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. 
But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Right? Get this one. This one's piercing, okay? 1 Corinthians 6, the Apostle Paul says, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between brothers? Guys, while as believers, we should be humble people, okay, who are willing to go low and repent when we've done something wrong, okay, and forgive quickly when someone has wronged us. Sometimes, some situations, they're just convoluted, right? They're just complex. As sinners, we are able to weave some crazy webs with our sin that wind up tangling us up. And we need help to get out. Sometimes we need someone skilled to come along with the the sword of the Spirit to come cut us loose out of that conflict. I'm sad to say this, but I have just seen too many times where two believers get into a conflict where they need help and where if, if they would have reached out to another brother or sister who had wisdom to a pastor or someone, right? Then, then they could have helped navigate the mess they were in and they could have gotten out with their love and their friendship preserved, right? But instead, what they did was they threw their hands up and they cut ties with one another. And several times I've seen professing believers even leave their church family just to avoid one person that they had a conflict with. Talk about throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Friends, this is not the Christian way of dealing with conflict. This is the secular world's way of handling conflict. It's basically cancel culture. It's saying, if someone wrongs me in a way that is painful the way that I'm going to deal with it is just never have to see them again. Never talk to them again. Church, that is lousy. That's lousy. What a poor witness to the gospel that is. This is why Paul says, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? He's asking that question rhetorically. His point is, if you're in a conflict that bad, find a wise brother in Christ who can help you. Okay, Find someone to help you. Don't act like a child who has a tantrum and takes their toys and goes home. Don't act like that. That is immature. It reveals a lacking understanding of the grace of God. Okay, Within the local church... God has given us wise brothers and sisters who love us and who love anyone else we might wind up in a conflict with. And so we should avail ourselves to the support of their counsel. Okay, In Matthew 18, what we see is that before the church is even born, Jesus anticipates there are going to be situations like this. Jesus is wise. He knows what's going to happen when he gets a bunch of sinners together in the same Family, right? That's why he says these things. That's why he gives this instruction. He says, if there's an issue between you and a fellow believer, go to them calmly and let them know what happened, okay? From experience, I would say eight or nine times out of 10, the conflict is resolved in that first step, okay? Because the Holy Spirit in both believers helps them to be humble enough to get things worked out. But in the off chance that that step doesn't bring a resolution, here's what Jesus says, right? Here's what Jesus says. Listen to what Jesus says. Don't go talk smack about them to a bunch of people. Don't go talk smack about them to a bunch of people. Don't bottle it up until it festers into bitterness. Don't run away and go find a new church to start over where no one knows you. 
find some wise, loving, reasonable, neutral believers in your gospel community. Tell them what's going on and ask them to mediate for you until you can come to a resolution. All right? This is what we've been instructed to do. And if we will follow it, then we can make it through our conflicts together, friends. We can make it through our conflicts together in peace instead of allowing our conflicts to to wreak havoc in our relationships. Church, the Bible has a lot of wisdom to offer us on the topic of handling conflict wisely. Don't neglect it. Don't neglect your Bible. Go to your Bible every day. Read a proverb a day. It'll keep the folly away. Okay? If we'll ask the Lord as we go to his word each day, to show us our own weakness and shortcomings, it's going to breed a posture of humility in dealing with others, which will in turn make handling conflict smoother. When we understand that all conflict is fueled by sin, oftentimes our own, and that's a problem between us and God before anyone else, then we'll be a lot better at diagnosing how conflicts happened in the first place. Okay? As we're proactive on these things, then it's going to aid us in always giving grace and benefit of the doubt in our relationships with fellow sinners. We'll grow to expect messiness and not get bent out of shape when we have to walk through it. And finally, if we'll get help when necessary from trustworthy counselors, then even our most challenging conflicts can be resolved and they can lead to growth and grace for us instead of crippling us and dividing us from our church family. Okay? Ultimately, the gospel should be our motivation for striving to make peace in any conflict that we find ourselves in. Here's here's what I mean. I'll close with this. In love, Christ went to the greatest lengths imaginable to reconcile the conflict that we sinfully created with God. Okay, that's, that's the gospel. And so in light of the gospel... There should be virtually nothing that would hinder Christians from settling their lesser conflicts. Okay? Do you see how the gospel is not only our motivation, but our strength to resolve conflict? No one has or ever will wrong you as severely as you have wronged God. You know that? No one has or ever will wrong you as severely as you have wronged God. Romans 5 says, Our sin was so bad, it made us enemies with God. And that Jesus dying and atoning death for us was the only possible way of making peace and reconciling us back to our Heavenly Father. That was the only way. It was so bad. And if Christ was willing to be crucified, In order to settle our conflict with God, what is there that could possibly come between us that would be bad enough that we can't find a way to reconcile? Right? If Jesus, the Son of God, and the King of all creation could humble himself to bring us peace, then in light of the cross, we too can humble ourselves to maintain peace with others. Let's pray. Father, God, you're good. Your word is true, Father. I just am in awe of how much truth that is constantly timely and relevant. You have just woven all throughout your word and the Proverbs, but all throughout your word. Father, I pray that as individuals, as men and women, but as a church body, God, we would not neglect your word, that we wouldn't neglect the awesome privilege that it is to know you through your word and be taught by you, to gain wisdom from you, specifically when it comes to conflict. God, I, I have a belief that if we would be more biblically literate, if we would know what our Bible say about things like conflict, we would do a lot better at handling it. I pray that's true for us increasingly as the Hub City Church. God, we know that we're not going to get through this life without more conflict. 
but I pray that we would increasingly be people who are seeing peace and growth and wisdom and grace at the end of our conflicts. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.